Good morning and welcome to New Community. We're glad that you could be with us this morning. Over the next 50 minutes, we'll have an opportunity to worship together through singing, prayer, and the sharing of God's word. We'll pass the peace to one another virtually. We'll listen to a message from Pastor Ken, and then we'll share communion together. And finally, we'll have a time of reflection and response. And after the service, we'll also have an opportunity for sharing and prayer. You can look at the prayer tab underneath this video for the Zoom meeting information. There's also information there about different opportunities to worship together throughout the week. We're glad that you could be with us this morning. Let's come together to God in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you with thankfulness for the many blessings and for your great love for us, which you've shown us through your Son, Jesus Christ. Your mercy is anew every morning. Indeed, great is your faithfulness. As we come to you this morning, some of us may be anxious. Parents may be anxious about school in the fall and what their children will be facing and how to keep them safe. Students may be anxious about how to deal with the changes and also with the uncertainties of the fall. And we may all be anxious about what the future holds. But we know, Lord, that you've given us your promise that if we lift our prayers to you, that you will give us your peace. We know that in the midst of all these uncertainties of the world, that you are our rock and our foundation. We can trust in you. Help us to be faithful to you. Help us to be encouraging to one another during this time. And help us to be examples of your love and your grace to all of those around us. We thank you again for the opportunity to come together and to worship you in prayer. May our hearts be open to your word and may our worship be pleasing to you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Yes. 
salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto Hello, my name is Ken, one of the pastors here at BCEC. I also wanted to welcome you. Uh, at this time, we'd like to uh, pass and extend the peace of Christ to one another, especially in this divided and fractured world. It's especially important for us as the body of Christ to come together and to be reminded that though we all may be different in many different ways, that we all have the same need, and that's our need for Jesus Christ, the one who gives us peace. And so... May we extend the peace of Christ to one another. Would you turn to the people who you may be worshiping with today, whether it be family members, roommates, whomever, want, want, want to text somebody, want to wave if you're on Zoom. Uh, let's uh, extend and pass the peace of Christ to one another. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you. continuing our sermon series from the book of Proverbs. Today's scripture reading is from Proverbs chapter 24 verses 17 to 18 and verses 28 to 29 and chapter 25 verses 21 to 22. Please join me as we read these passages together. Proverbs 24 verses 17 to 18. Do not rejoice when the enemy falls and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Proverbs 24, verses 28 to 29. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. Proverbs 25, verses 21 to 22. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. If he is thirsty, Give him water to drink, for you will heap burning coals on his head, and the Lord will reward you. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Hello once again. Uh, Pastor Ken here. Last week we started a new sermon series that will run uh, until the fall. Uh, we're going to be looking at themes through the book of Proverbs, and we started a sermon series last summer, actually, and, and the whole goal was to continue uh, this summer, and so, uh, so we feel like it's good to kind of bring this back again, especially in a time where um, our world uh, just is kind of a really crazy place, and as, as, as God's people, we should probably mull over uh, more of Proverbs because we need... A lot of wisdom in times like these. And so today's theme that we're going to be taking a look at is how do we deal with our enemies? How do we deal with our enemies? And so, again, a, a timely topic, I think, considering uh, the times that we live in. And so uh, before we um, begin, would you join me in a word of prayer? Let's pray. Uh, God, thank you for bringing us together. Thank you that we have an opportunity to spend time in your word. And we pray that you would breathe life into us, Lord, as we spend time uh, just interacting with your truth, as we experience your grace, as we um, hopefully are resolved to live out our lives uh, in such a way that would honor you, especially uh, at times like these. And so, Lord, would you be with us as the word is being preached, be with us as uh, the sacraments will be observed, and may you fill us with yourself. In Christ's name, amen. How many of you have ever, okay, let's be honest here. How many of you have ever secretly, perhaps, or not so secretly, relished 
or taking delight in somebody else's failure. Especially somebody who you know, is better than you or maybe somebody that you're jealous of or maybe you secretly envy. How many of you, uh, when that person fails, when that person stumbles, you secretly like, yes, like I, that person had it coming or you just, you just feel like it's justified and, and you just you derive some pleasure from it. You, your, your heart is glad because this happened, this misfortune happened. And so um, there's no English word that best describes that emotion, but there is one in German. And I, I took four years of German in high school. I forgot it all. It's not the reason why I know this word. I looked it up on the internet. Uh, but it's this word called Schadenfreude. Schaden means damage and Freude means joy. And so the word means one who takes pleasure or joy in somebody else's failure or misfortune. Now, as you, if you think about schadenfreude, it's really all over the place if you think about it. I mean, it's in the world of politics, in the world of sports, in the world of celebrity. There's something about us that just derive, derives pleasure and joy when we see other people fail. Why do we take pleasure and joy watching fail videos on YouTube or Facebook when people slip up and fall and hit their head and just what have you? We just kind of, you know, just for whatever reason, we're drawn by people's failures. Why do we love sports bloopers when these amazing athletes goes and looks like he's about to make an amazing dunk and then they, they, they flop and they, they bang it on, on the backboard? Again, there's something about our hearts that takes pleasure and other people's misfortunes and failures. So what are we supposed to make of this emotion? I mean, maybe we're make, I, I, maybe by bringing this up, I, we're making too much of a big deal out of it, right? I, it seems harmless. What's wrong with, you know, enjoying a meme here and there, enjoying kind of a little zinger? Now, again, I'm not here to try to take away your fun or what have you, but I do think it's important for us to reflect upon this, this response and, and to kind of unpack that a little bit because I, I, I believe and I think the scripture is trying to tell us that if we allow this, this spirit of schadenfreude um, become a, 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 a way of, of thinking and being, uh, if, it be, if it's something that we're, we're shaped by, um, it's, it's a path that I, I think we'll see in a moment that, that isn't healthy for us, that doesn't really bring the life that, that, that I think we're seeking and looking after or looking for. And so, so I think it's important for us to kind of, to kind of examine this a little bit. And, and the Proverbs actually speaks of it. And, and so, so as we uh, take a look at these sections, there's going to be three things that we need to ask ourselves. Uh, number one, uh, why do we need to resist this impulse of schadenfreude? Why do we need to resist it? Um, it seems not a big deal. What's the, what's the problem? Why, why do we need to resist it? Secondly, if we're not to do that, then what should we do instead? What should we do instead? And lastly, you're going to be taking a look at uh, where should our delight come from? Where should our delight come from then? So uh, let's take a look. Why should we resist this, this impulse to take joy in other people's failures? Now, let me just try a distinction. I, you know, Again, I, I don't want to be this killjoy and try to take away your fun. I, I think there is something to um, just being able to take yourself, not to take yourself too seriously, perhaps. And so amongst friends, perhaps, you, you know, we fall on a banana peel, something happens. And, you know, as long as nobody gets really hurt, as long as just the ego is maybe bruised a little bit, you know, is it okay to jab and poke a little bit? I think there's perhaps leeway in some ways, but I, I think... Uh, it, but is there a line? Is there a line where things get, get too, too personal or when things get too caustic or too, uh, when, when things are, are taken to a level that, that is harmful both for yourself and the other person? I, I think uh, there is. And so let's look at uh, uh, chapter 24, uh, verse 17 through 18. It says, Do not rejoice when your enemy falls, and let not your heart be glad when he stumbles. Let me stop there for a moment, and we'll read verse 18 in a moment. Um, but the writer of Proverbs uh, seems to think and indicate that, that we are not to rejoice when our enemy falls. Now, let me, let me um, preface by saying this. Like, and when we say enemies, we mean 
uh, not, not a national enemy per se, not somebody you perhaps don't know personally, but I, I think this enemy is speaking of somebody who, who, who you know, somebody who is perhaps has wronged you, somebody you hold perhaps resentment or you're maybe envious towards. Um, I think we're talking about more on personal terms than just, just kind of the more, more the impersonal realm. And, and the, the, the words of to, to rejoice, to be, to, that your heart be glad, those are pretty, um, those are pretty weighty words if you, if you were to think about it. It's, it's words that, that, that um, in a sense, describe what's going on in the heart. And I think the Bible uh, really kind of uh, makes a, a really um, a big deal about, about the heart in terms of what it is. It, it's the main kind of center of just your emotions and your, your motives and, and what your, uh, what your um, purpose is and all these different things. It's the seed of emotions that, that kind of where everything kind of spills forth. And so, so when he says, do not rejoice or do not let your heart be glad, it's, it's really talking about what comes out of the center of your beating. Don't rejoice in another person, especially in your enemy's failure or misfortune. Now, why? Why? What's what's the big deal? Because if you think about it, it's the most natural instinct. If you think about it, right? I mean, just think about just in your own relationships, and when you think about when somebody stumbles and falls, especially somebody you don't like particularly much for whatever reason, we just can't help but laugh or just secretly just kind of stick it to them, right? Well, I think we begin to see clues in verse eighteen. Do, again, verse seventeen: Do not rejoice when your enemy falls. And let not your heart be glad when he stumbles, lest the Lord see it and be displeased and turn away his anger from him. Now, what I think what this kind of shows us is that, you know, even though we're pleased by our you know, enemy's misfortune, it doesn't please God in the same way. It certainly does not please God when we are engaging in that. And so it goes to show there is a, a distinction or a difference in terms of how the events are being interpreted. It, it gives us a, a snapshot into the heart and the character of God, that the things that, that we derive pleasure out of, um, it doesn't seem that God sees it in the same way. That even though, even if God is the one who is, who is the main source of inflicting perhaps a justice or punishment or wrath towards an enemy, God does not delight in it. And I think that's an important distinction because sometimes as human beings, as sinful human beings for that matter, we can't separate the two, can we? But God in His holiness can, that yes, He brings justice upon humankind, especially towards those who oppose Him, but He in no way relishes it. He in no way takes pleasure in his enemy's opposition, or in, in his downfall, the fact that he's suffering. And, and, and so if that is the case, if that's kind of how God sees the situation, um, then it probably makes sense that who are we uh, to, to do that, in a sense, for us to kind of add to it, to add to their judgment, to add to, um, uh, to the punishment, because when it comes to wrath, when it comes to discipline, when it comes to all these things, that's in the realm of God. Retribution, vindication, that's God's job. That's God's role. That's His ordained position to do that. He's the one who sees all. He's the one who judges justly. Whereas for us, we cannot. We don't see the whole picture. We don't have the whole backstory. And so for us to take pleasure in somebody else's misfortune you know, it's, 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 we want to see what we want to see, and, and oftentimes we just want to zero in on the fact that this person is clearly in the wrong, I'm right, that person deserves what he or she gets, and we derive pleasure from it. And so here we see that this displeases God uh, for us to have such attitudes or to have that kind of response to an enemy's misfortune and pain. And God is even willing to kind of relent from his anger to teach us, to show us that this is not the way in which his people are to respond in the situations. Now, our motivation to, to not do these things shouldn't be, oh, well, 
God, let let it fly. You know, keep keep make sure that you you press your your your, your wrath and judgment on him. Okay, if, that's not the that's not the point either. Uh, but the point is that that if we do not check ourselves, if we do not resist this impulse, then there's going to be problems. That we're becoming less and less human as we do these very things, and so. This kind of leads to kind of another sub point that again, if the reason why I need to resist it is is that if we don't, then it's going to take the next step. And so the next step is it goes from the private relishing of the heart, and and it moves towards action. So let's look at uh, chapter twenty four, four verses twenty eight to twenty nine. Be not a witness against your neighbor without cause, and do not deceive with your lips. Do not say, I will do to him as he has done to me. I will pay the man back for what he has done. Now, again, what what this indicates is this, is that if our hearts, um, again, delight in the misfortune and the pain of our enemies, uh, it's only a matter of time, if unchecked, that we're going to take another step. Because oftentimes what our actions flow out of where our hearts are, right? And so do not be a witness against your neighbor without cause. It, it gives room for when somebody offends us or somebody sins against us to, again, approach that person. Uh, Matthew 18, regarding how we resolve conflict, bringing, bringing your grievance or charge before somebody. All those things are assumed in, in play. But it says, be not a witness against a neighbor without cause. Do not deceive with your lips. In other words, oftentimes when somebody is down, uh, namely your enemies are, are, are vulnerable and down, what do we do? We want to kick them when we're down. And, and oftentimes we, in our own inter- bitterness or anger perhaps, we will exaggerate the, the person's fault, we'll turn them into a caricature, we will defame them with our words, what have you, we'll contribute to this person's demise. And so that's what inevitably will happen if, again, we do not resist this impulse of schadenfreude, where we take pleasure in our enemy's misfortune and vulnerability. And so, again, this shows us just a few things. One, uh, just kind of where our hearts, it reveals our hearts in many regards, does it not? That, that this is the way oftentimes we, we derive our, our joy and pleasure is, again, not is when we see other people fail. You know, there's um, researchers have, um, you know, of course they, study the brain and what have you, and there's a special part of the brain where it's kind of the reward center. And one of the, re- one of the things that triggers the reward that gives us a sense of pleasure is, is uh, just, it's just this, this part of us that, that um, derives a sense of, of, of reward, not based on how well we're doing or how not well we're doing, but it's how well or not well we're doing in respect to other people. It's very fascinating because if we're in a vacuum, you know, we're, we're, where there's nobody around, we usually get certain satisfaction when we accomplish certain things, right? But the moment a person or persons enter into the picture, uh, it gives us, uh, I guess, a sense. What it does is it causes us to compare ourselves to other people. And so what they found is that when a, when a person does really, really well at something, but then they see somebody does something a little bit better than you, you feel bad, right? And, and the opposite is true. Like if you, um, if you uh, kind of do something so-so um, and you feel kind of bad for yourself, uh, bad about yourself initially, but then you see other people do way worse than you, then you feel better about yourself, right? It kicks the reward center in your brain. Again, yeah, this is kind of shot and Freud all over again, right? That there is something in our that it triggers this reward center where we feel, we feel pleasure uh, when we feel like we're just a little better than other people, or even better, or or or, or when other people are in a, in a worse place, that again we feel better about ourselves. Like, for example, if you let's say you're in a relationship, whether you're boyfriend girlfriend or you're married, and you know you're relatively content and happy with your relationship. Uh, but then you look on Instagram or you look on Facebook and you see another couple um, who, you know, from all appearances, is just having the time of their lives. They're on vacation or what have you, and they're just, they're just killing it. They're just, you know, 
and, and you look at them, and even though your relationship and your you know situation is great, just to see another person kind of rolling in a little bit, it makes you feel bad about yourself. Or maybe you hang out with a family, and they're having all sorts of turmoil in their family. You know, the marriage isn't great, kids are rebelling, what have you. You come out of that experience feeling, whew, like at least I'm not like them. There's a certain, again, you derive a certain pleasure that we're in a better situation than another person. Or would it be grades, right? You got an A minus or what have you, and, and you know, you were pretty happy with it until what? You find out that your friend who didn't study at all and they got, you know, a few percentage points is higher than you, and you like, dang, what's what's you get you get riled up about that. So again, as you think about Schadenfreude, there's just this this natural response within us. And we kind of have to ask ourselves, is this the way you want to live your life? Where we're so driven by what goes on around us and that our ups and downs are so dependent upon just what, are peop- what people are doing around you. And, 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 and yet what we do oftentimes, again, we, we try to find ways to feel better about ourselves and compare ourselves in such a way so that, so that we feel a certain way. The question is, is that the way you want to live your life? Does that, is that, you know, as, 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 especially as believers in Jesus Christ, is this the way in which God would want us to see ourselves? And is this the way we're supposed to see other people? Well, let's take a look uh, at in another chapter, chapter 25, because um, I, think, I think the scriptures tell us a, a, a different way to live, which I think at first seems like, what? Like, why would we want to live this way? But... But I really believe that it is kind of the path and road towards towards something better. So let's look at verse 25, verse 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he is thirsty, give him water to drink. I don't know about you, but maybe that's not the answer that you're looking for necessarily. But when it comes to... um, People, especially those who you're resentful towards, those you're envious, jealous towards, what have you, those who you take secret pleasure in their misfortune, um, the Bible seems to say, rather than, you know, continue in just taking pleasure in their in their misfortune, uh, rather do the opposite, do the counterintuitive thing. When they're in this vulnerable position, don't rejoice over that. When they're in this place of where they're they're impoverished, don't kick them while they're down. Rather, restore them to their humanity. Restore their dignity. Where they're impoverished, feed them. Where, they, where they're in desperate need, give them something refreshing. Again, that, that seems so counterintuitive to how we operate, how our world operates for that matter. There's, there's nothing about that that makes sense, does it not? There's nothing about that that seems natural to us at all. I know it doesn't to me. And, and so... Um, yeah, this is what God seems to say to us. And again, what, what is, why is God doing that? Why is God saying such what seemingly seem, what seems like nonsensical things? And the, the only way that I can perhaps explain this or begin to kind of unpack this is that, well, what seems strange to us, what seems counterintuitive to you and me is not counterintuitive to God because this is how God is. Isn't this how God operates oftentimes? That God, you know, again, does not take pleasure in the misfortune of even of his enemies. And so kind of adding on to that is that when God sees even his enemies fall, even when his enemies in an impoverished position, what does God do? God, he feeds the hungry, does he not? He gives drink to the thirsty. That that's just his character. That's his heart. That that he treats us better than we deserve. He treats you and I better than we deserve. And so, if we are to be honest with ourselves, it shouldn't be as surprising to us if we remember that you and I were once enemies of God as well. That. We, went, we just wanted to live our own lives our own way, however we wanted, 
We took pleasure in other people's misfortune. We just lived our lives how we saw fit. We responded to our own impulses, whatever that is, even our worst impulses, and we rejected God. We didn't want to have anything to do with God, but it was through His mercy, was it not, that when we were in an impoverished place, spiritually and physically perhaps, when we were in a place of great vulnerability, when we were in a place of incredible weakness, did God treat you as your sins deserve? Or did He instead give you bread and wine to feed you, to nourish you, to bring you back to life? Did He not do that through His Son, Jesus Christ? Did He not do that through His Son where He through his life, death, and resurrection, <laughs> took what was dead and now resurrected it so that we could become alive again? Wasn't he the one who, who, shows, who, 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 who took us from being enemies to now being friends and now family, for that matter? See, what seems, again, counterintuitive for us is not for God. You see, in our world, um, we, we again, as Jesus said, you know, two weeks ago in the Sermon on the Mount, we talked about, you know, you have heard it said, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but I say to you, and he gives this really counterintuitive, countercultural way of living in terms of how we're to relate people who oppose us, for how to relate to people who, who hate us and who, who have given us in our lives a hard time. And he gives us a totally, again, counterintuitive to us, way of living, but it is not counterintuitive to God. That God himself is willing to see his enemies differently, including you and I. You know, Brian Stevenson, Brian Stevenson the civil rights um, lawyer, uh, author of Just Mercy, um, you know, he's famous for saying that uh, each person in our society is more than the worst thing that they've ever done, right? And And again, this is this is God's heart that He sees that He doesn't see us uh, with uh, the lens of the worst thing that we've ever done. If if that was the case, if God saw us uh, based on the worst thing we've ever done, we just what, what would we possibly do? We all have things that that bring us great shame and dishonor to our families and what have you. And if we were treated by the worst things we've ever done, then we're all finished. But if it is indeed true that God uh, treats us better that he sees us better than, than what we, the worst thing we've ever done, then there is tremendous hope, is there not? And if we ourselves are able to take on God's mind and God's heart and, and, and able to see people the way that he sees people, then it's not as crazy or surprising that God would call us to do the very same thing. Again, he doesn't call us to do things that he himself isn't willing to do. And so that is the, the gift or the opportunity for us to, to do the, the very thing that we don't want to do, to love those we feel like don't deserve our love. That that's what's going to break just the cycle of violence and, and resentment and bitterness and what have you, is when finally somebody is willing to not only declare a ceasefire, but is willing to again be extravagant in their love towards those who don't deserve it. You know, as we think about uh, just kind of our, our, our time and place, you know, what happens in our world especially is that, that we, again, are just dehumanizing other people and treating people in, in, as their sins deserve, or we treat people and see people, we choose to see people by the worst thing that they've ever done. And in the course of doing that, <laughs> we're not only just pigeonholing them, and, and saying this is who they are, and we're locked in on this, this narrative of who they are. Um, and meanwhile, while we're doing that, unbeknownst enough to ourselves, or the fact that we're just so blind to the fact that as we do that, we're becoming less and less human ourselves. And as, as you see this cycle continue and continue and continue, um, then it should be no surprise that our world is the way it is, is that we don't see each other like God sees us, that we're all image bearers, created to reflect His image, reflect, created so that we could, could, could mirror Him and reflect Him in the world, but we're so far from that. We are all those, are, 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 we have distorted God's image, 
And yet, the hope of our world is God in Christ remaking and re reworking and renewing this world, starting with you and me, by seeing life, seeing people differently, seeing them as God sees them. You see, um, as we think about just what we're meant to do, we're, again, we're supposed to do the th- very things that God does himself, that he loves in, 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 in a counterintuitive way. But where does our true delight comes from? It, the true delight comes from just this very thing, the, the, the opportunity to actually see and witness firsthand the transformation that happens in ourselves and the transformation that, that happens in other people when we choose to overcome evil, but not by not doing more evil, but e- overcoming evil by doing good. You see, when in verse uh, 24, 22, excuse me, um, let's go back to 21. If your enemy is hungry, give him bread to eat. And if he's thirsty, give him water to drink. For you will keep burning coals on his head. And there's a lot of like debate as far as what does that actually mean. Um, it, it's really kind of talking about the fact that when we do good, this unexpected good, when people just like kind of just know that this is a contentious relationship, you know there's all this, all this um, history of backbiting, what have you, and when, when somebody kind of chooses to stop and, and, and changes the narrative and does the complete opposite of what has normally been done, it, it has the ability to, to shock somebody into change, meaning as, as people are engaged in darkness, as people are engaged in dehumanizing activities, when somebody actually does something that's humanizing, it's like this burning coals in the sense that it, it brings upon shame. It's meant to, to, to help people see, to singe the conscience, if you will, of, of their own dark hearts. And that's kind of the, the, the I believe God, God is trying to say that's the only way where things will finally change in our relationships and, in, and especially in our society when people start doing that. Instead of returning evil with more evil and being overcome by evil, rather we're supposed to overcome evil with good. That's the only way the cycle ends. That's the only way when bridges can be built. That's the only way where people can become people again when we start treating people like humans, when they're impoverished to feed them, when they're thirsty to give them something to drink. See, that is the reward in some ways, the fact that you are able to, to co-labor with God to, to do this. Because obviously, this counterintuitive love that nobody, else, none of us can do on our own strength, uh, the fact that we get to experience that and to put that into practice, that in itself is the great reward when we're able to see, oh my goodness, this is actually working. This counterintuitive thing of forgiveness and, and, and letting go and, and, and loving people, it, this actually is changing me. And it's letting me let go of bitterness. It's letting me go of, let, letting me f- be free of, of just this, this, this clenched fist of, of just holding on to, to all these different things. And, and instead, I'm experiencing something altogether different, that it gives me the ability to rejoice with those who are doing better than me. Like even when I'm not in a great place to actually sincerely and genuinely rejoice for somebody else's success. Or even when somebody is going through a difficult time and suffering that we could, instead of relishing in it, that we actually like our hearts break for them, that our hearts grieve for them, that we, there's not a, a part of us that is in any way just, just celebrating that. I, I don't know about you, but I, I that's the kind of life that I would like. And, I, and I, I'm still far, I, I still have a long way to go. There are days when, they're, they're, when I'm able to experience that joy and freedom to be able to genuinely care, even for people who, who I disagree with or those people who I've had beef or history with. But there are days where I just feel like, man, like I fall flat on my face, I, I say something that I, I shouldn't have said, or I, I, I feel like the, the joy that comes from, from, from just celebrating somebody's defeat. And then it just like grieves me. But yet, we believe in a God that doesn't give up on us, <laughs> thankfully. We believe in a God that, that, that is patient with us, the God, a God who wants to work with us, a God who, who wants to just 
come alongside of us in this journey. And so that is the, the great hope that I have for myself, the great hope that I have for the world that we live in, that one person at a time chipping away, trying to kind of live in this way and trying to see if this kind of catches on, um, that this is kind of a new kind of viral thing that, that is able to like infiltrate our society. That's kind of my hope. And, and, but it takes small steps. It means evaluating your relationships. And, and in any way, there is an ounce of just glee or, or, or uh, rejoicing in things that we shouldn't rejoice in, that we would resist that impulse so that we can rejoice in the things that, that are meant to be rejoiced, that we, our hearts could be, could be glad in things that are, are worthy of being glad in. And may I submit to you that that would be our wonderful God in Jesus Christ, the one who just, again, rather than pour out wrath and anger towards us, that he shows us incredible and extravagant mercy and grace, a grace that transforms us from the inside out, a grace that enables us to see things differently, enables us to, to be able to see others differently. And so may we take joy in that. So let's pray, and especially as we get ready for communion, uh, let's, uh, let's just prepare our hearts to meet him and to, to receive uh, this grace once again through the sacraments. Let's pray. Father, uh, we come before you recognizing that in of ourselves and our own strength that this kind of love that, that you call us towards, is, is, there's not an ounce that within us, that instead, um, if left alone, we, we, we have very little capacity to love in such a way. But Lord, if so exists the possibility where, where, where we're able to be filled by you or reminded by you, just extravagant love, would you do that now for us, that you would fill up our tank, that you would fill up uh, just our, our, ourselves so that we can have the capacity to, to, to love and treat people in ways that, that we never thought we could ever do or imagine. And so, Lord, I just pray that you deal with us, whatever relationships that are frayed and, and relationships that are, are fractured, that, that you would repair it, Lord, and that you would repair us first so that we can seek reconciliation and and wholeness in relationships with others, Lord. So, Lord, help us, we pray, and as we, especially as we um, spend time around your table, that you would renew our faith, renew our strength, and renew your love uh, in and through us. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to gather around uh, the table uh, to celebrate uh, the Lord's Supper together. And so if you are the one who is uh, charged with preparing the elements, I encourage you to uh, take a moment and, and get ready for that. Uh, but as we, uh, the reason why we do this is to remember who Christ is and what he's done for us. And so we invite uh, the real presence of Christ to, to just be with us as we as we just reflect upon our own lives, as we reflect upon who God is in Christ, and, 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 and that we would, by the Holy Spirit, be, be able to, again, be empowered and strengthened in our faith and to uh, be able to um, live our lives in such a way that, that is empowered by, by His love. And so uh, we invite you to, uh, especially those of you who our believers in Jesus Christ and who have been baptized uh, to partake of this meal. And, and for those of you who have not made that decision yet, I would encourage you to consider just placing your faith in Jesus, getting baptized. We're going to have a baptism service, a uh, socially distant one in, in September. And so we would invite you to consider getting baptized as well. And so uh, as we begin, would you join me in a word of prayer? And as I end the prayer, I just invite you to uh, pray with me the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray. Father, we give you thanks uh, for, again for, for bringing us together uh, as your people. And although we are not able to uh, be together in one space, uh, we thank you that we're able to gather in this way online and in our homes. 
And although we long for the day when we can see each other face to face, when we can just be commune with each other in this way, um, Lord, uh, I pray that you would satisfy our longings, God. You would satisfy the, the hunger that we have and the thirst we have for, for your presence and for the presence of your, your people. Lord, we, we miss being together. We miss uh, just the physical presence of, of our brothers and sisters. We miss being in your presence uh, in, in, our, in our sanctuary. Uh, but Lord, we thank you that, um, that the church of Jesus Christ is not the walls of, uh, walls of the building, but the church of Jesus Christ is, is us. It's your, it's your people, uh, your body. And so we thank you that, um, that it was through your body that was broken for us that we have life. It's because of the blood that you shed that we, our sins can be forgiven and that we can have new life in you. And so Lord, fill us, we pray. Fill us with your presence that we may uh, feel uh, and sense your, your, your grace and, and your favor and that it would strengthen us, Lord, for the days ahead. Lord, these days have been long. This time of the pandemic has been really uh, just been wearing on us. And so, Lord, we desperately need your presence. We desperately need uh, just your touch, Lord, as we eat of this, as we drink. Make, make yourself real to us. And we pray together in one voice, praying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. On the night when Jesus was betrayed, he gathered his disciples together. And after giving thanks, he took the bread and he broke it, saying, um, this is my body, broken for you. Eat of it. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the cup of the new covenant, shed in my blood for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it. Do this in remembrance of me. Whenever you eat this bread, and whenever you drink this cup, you are proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. I just invite you to uh, take bread, and when you're ready, uh, let's... Let's eat together, okay? Brothers and sisters, uh, this is uh, Christ's body broken for you. Shall we eat together? Let's eat. Everyone, let's take the cup. This is Christ's blood shed for the forgiveness of sins. Drink of it. Let's do this together. Let's pray. Lord, we remembering once again that while we were sinners, while we were enemies of you, that Christ died for us. We thank you, Lord, that when we were hungry, when we were thirsty, you gave us spiritual nourishment. And we thank you for this time uh, that we have together as a, as a church body to uh, remember um, who you are and what you've done in our lives. And Lord, as we... Um, Offer ourselves to you as we offer our whole selves, Lord. And may it be a response to the fact that you offered your whole self to us, Lord, that you withheld nothing and gave it all so that we might have all. And so, Lord Jesus, may we give all to you in, in everything, everyday things of life, Lord. And so, as we face the world, a world full of chaos and division and heartache, uh, remind us, Lord, uh, that that in and through our lives, that, that we're meant to bring a bit of beauty, a goodness and justice into this world. And so, Lord, may um, we do that, Lord, in the power of the Spirit. May we do that gladly because of what you've done for us. And may we rejoice in, in you and, and what is to come. And so we um, just give ourselves to you, and we want to respond to you. In Christ's name we pray. 
Amen. Uh, shall we respond uh, with worship, respond with singing? And so that's all that's going to lead us to our last song. And so would you continue to reflect on the goodness of our Lord? So let's worship. This is how we know, this is how we know what love is, just when we look at your cross. This is where we see, this is where we see how love works, you surrendered your all. This is how we know that you have loved us first this is where we chose to love you in return for you so love the world that you gave your only son love amazing so divine we will love you in return for this life that you give for this death that you have died love amazing so divine we will love you in reply lord this is how we know this is how we know what love is just don't look at your we know that you have loved us first. This is where we chose to love you in return. For you so love the world that you gave your only son. Love amazing, so divine. We will love you in return for this life that you that you have done of amazing so divine we will love you in reply Lord. once again thank you for joining us for worship uh, today and uh, we hope that you stick around for our after service kind of zoom gathering where we just connect with one another and support and pray for one another. So uh, if, if you're new, we encourage you to check it out and we, we'd just love to meet you and, and yeah, just be able to journey together. Um, and so uh, we also have community groups and prayer meetings and many other ways in which to get involved. And so uh, we just encourage you to, to get connected and we'd love to meet you sometime. So as you leave this place, just wanna encourage you, uh, go with God's blessings. And so may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of the Father and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. And all God's people say together, amen. Go in peace and we'll see you in a little bit or we'll see you next week. Have a good week.